morning we begin our today's lecture on realism. So, realism as an artistic device has its roots in the writings of French writers such as Balzac, Honoré de Balzac, Flaubert, Gustave Flaubert and Emile Zola. Uh, of course, they are also related, they are also associated with the concept of naturalism. So, realism and naturalism are two concepts which people usually use interchangeably, but uh, they are not always so and perhaps one of these days I will discuss in detail some movie which is more naturalistic and less realistic. So, um, that is one aspect. Realism is uh, uh, generally understood as an illusion when we talk about film studies as an illusion that what is shown on a screen is connected to reality. Okay. We are watching something which is ve very, very real, okay, true. Uh, so, people have often argued what is recognizable and what is real. Is there a difference between or are, can they be used interchangeably? Is everything that is recognizable real and vice versa? Hmm? So, realism is a mix of devices to uh, which filmmakers use to disguise the fact that after all what we are what whatever we are watching is not real. There is lot of controversy about realism and so how realistic can you be that is the idea. Now, uh, naturalism as a concept is based on Darwin's idea about nature that is natural conditions play a significant role in the shaping of the individual's mind and character. Realism however, derives its ideology from Marxist theories of economics that is economic conditions of a person play a significant role in the conditioning of his or her mind and character. Remember, both these concepts have an element of fatalism. For example, you read Tess and Flaubert's Madame Bovary in order to understand the subtle distinctions between these concepts better. Yeah. Now, um, you just watched a clipping from Sidney Lumet's Dog Day Afternoon, a 1973 film based on a real life heist. What are the uh, uh, indications that this could be a realistic movie? It is usually regarded as a realistic movie, not just because it portrays something which actually happened. But what were the uh, signs, what were the semiotics, you have already done the codes, the signs, the symbols which tell you that it is very real. Okay, uh, so, the initial montage about the people of Brooklyn hmm? and what kind of people are those? Class. Working class, that is what we understand Brooklyn is. Yeah. It is a, a predominantly um, not very affluent place. People are working class, low middle class, middle class and who struggle with their day to day lives. Uh, what else? What? Shown by, uh, oh, we will come to that later. I am just talking about the first 5 minutes, the credit sequence. Every day, we don't. We are not told that uh, anything uh, drastic is going to happen. Okay, uh, so we are never given any kind of indication, good visit, that anything drastic is going to happen today. Anything startling is going to happen today. It's a, it's an everyday. It's, it's a regular, average day in the life of an average New Yorker or a book, a person from Brooklyn. Okay, that's the idea. Okay. Um, there is there is trash somewhere, there are beggars somewhere, homeless people. So, Sidney Lumet is very attentive to details, to everyday details. This was just an everyday, this was just a regular day okay. and then something like this happened. Hmm? But 
while doing that while showing us that this was just a regular normal day, he shows us certain details of Brooklyn, which are extremely realistic, which if you go to that part of New York, you will find that it is indeed true even today. Okay. So, that is the idea to show reality and how, how does he achieve that kind of realism. Now, I am asking you a more technical question, when uh, Sidney Lumet shows that Brooklyn is after all uh, uh, not a very rich place, not a very affluent place, then uh, he shows you certain scenes, certain shots, which depict the lives of very ordinary regular people, hmm? uh, also very po poor people that is also there. Uh, but what? What does he do to do that? Was it looked like a footage, hmm? like a video footage. The quality of the shots hmm? uh, had the natural lighting and it looked more Exactly. Different. What she is trying to say is, it had a documentary feel to it. Hmm? It had a documentary feel to it. Uh, she is also trying to tell you that uh, it looks like the filmmaker resorted to using as much uh, uh, natural light as possible. So, that means, it was not shot inside a studio, remember that. Okay. So, the, the um, camera people, the cinematographer, the director, they must have just gone out on the real streets and captured the lives of real people and taken shots of the real garbage. Okay. They must have uh, uh, glossed over certain aspects, but uh, it looks like um, it was shot in a natural setting and in natural lights. So, that is one of the aspects, that is one of the uh, um, devices used by those filmmakers who aspire to make realistic films, as opposed to what? As opposed to what? Realism as opposed to You know, when you talk about artificially constructed sets, artificial lights to make people look prettier than they are, to make sets look prettier than, uh, places look prettier than they really are. So, there was a time when uh, New York would be constructed, you know, MGM was known for that. MGM studio, are you aware of that? So, it, there was a point when MGM was a city in itself and they had replicas, miniature replicas of all the famous monuments and landmarks of New York. They do not want to go outside to and trouble their beautiful actors and female actors to uh, get exposed to real people and real lights. So, whatever was then was in done inside the set, on the sets, inside the studio. Okay. This was, this was uh, this tendency to be as realistic as possible started during the late 50s, caught on during the 60s, especially with Bonnie and Clyde. If you are aware of the movie, please watch it, note down the name, Bonnie and Clyde. And then, the so called Hollywood new wave cinema, Easy Rider is one. And then, we had cinema of uh, those new wave American authors, Martin Scorsese, Mean Streets, Taxi Driver, we had Sidney Lumet of course, and then we also had Coppola, who actually was audacious enough to go all the way on location and shoot his apocalypse now. Right? Woody Allen also tried to do as much shooting outside on real locations. Uh, as opposed to creating a replica of the crowd. So, this is one uh, way in which filmmakers try to attain realism. We will be talking about realism as a theory as we go on. Um, key theoreticians of realism and you can look at Raymond Williams book called Key Concepts. And uh, it uh, he gives plenty of description of what is realism. So, it is a very good way to begin understanding. It is not like the definitive book, but he 
it is like a dictionary of terms, key concepts. So, please take a look at Raymond Williams key concepts, um, Rudolf Arnheim, Siegfried Preco and Andre Bezon who we keep on repeat, uh, referring to in this course, Andre Bezon, the French theoretician. Okay, now, historical context of cinema and realism, it begins from 1839 with uh, the invention of uh, photography. 1877, we had the invention of phonograph. And between 1889 and 1895, the Lumia brothers initiated their cinema project. So, you can look these names up and see what is their contribution towards the growth of cinema. They are the pioneers of course, but you should understand what, what they did. And the idea was that uh, with uh, so much uh, uh, in, uh, innovation in technology uh, and uh, development in uh, photography, camera would be able to capture an objective truth about the world. There is a difference between subjectivity and objectivity. So, the intention was or the ambition was to capture the objective truth. A realist film at least uh, desires or aims to present uh, what appears on the screen as real and as natural. So, one of the earliest efforts in this direction was the Lumiere's shot called workers leaving the Lumiere factory. And I quote one of the brothers um, who said, the purpose of cinema is to capture life on the run, life as it moves. Therefore, workers leaving the factory. So, workers leaving the factory, real people on real location and captured in real lights, in real time. So, they were not asked to put on some extra makeup or put uh, wear some pretty clothes, they were captured as they were, hmm? capturing the objective truth. Now, I will uh, take a leap from because in between cinema went through several stages and we have already referred to some, you know the MGM studio system, where everything was monumental. The idea was not to, uh, not really, uh, they did not aspire to be realistic, but aspire to be grand. Grandeur was the operative word there, hmm? make things as big, as uh, uh, impressive as possible. And then after several stages, counterculture cinema, realistic cinema, we came to a spot where things started happening and people thought that why not capture life as it is, life on the run, going back to what the Lumiere advised us to do. So, Andy Warhol, one of uh, the other day someone was mentioning Andy Warhol. So, um, he made a couple of shots and one was called sleep, where his friend John Giorno uh, was captured on camera in long takes, sleeping for 5 hours and 20 minutes. And if you go to the net, you will actually find clippings from the movie. It is a nicely done film and it is experimental. Uh, it was called an anti film. Now, why would, it, why would you call such a film an anti film? My question to you, a man is sleeping okay, for 5 hours and 20 minutes and the camera rests on him and whatever he is doing while he is sleeping. No one told him, no one tells you what to do when you sleep. Okay, so, you are captured as you are, the objective truth, hmm? but it was called, people called it an anti film. What do you think would, could be an anti film? Think there's about no it. Motion. Hmm? There's no plot. Okay. okay. There's no plot. Okay. There's no plot. No entertainment. After all, we go to movies to get entertained. Yeah, that's 
the truth <laughs> cannot be challenged. What else? No, he moved while sleeping. So, there was some motion. Okay. Perhaps the prevail. They know progress. Maybe if you look at the concept of progress and uh, interpret it threadbare, then you can even say that, uh, well, from start to finish, yeah, the man wo slept for 5 hours and then he woke up. There is a plot, there is a progression. You see, something was happening. Subverted the idea of film at 1963. Exactly. Narrative, you know, challenging the concept of narrative and think of what we have done in this class while we were discussing the concept of narrative. It challenged or subverted everything that a narrative should be and why not. And again, is another short empire. Are you aware of that? Are you aware of empire? What empire? Look it up. Andy Warhol's empire. What is it about? Empire State Building, a single shot of the famous Empire State Building from early evening one day till 3 a.m. next morning. Okay, and what was happening there? What, what change could have happened? Light. light. Natural light, a real monument captured in natural light. So, if you look it up, you will find the Empire State Building in all its glory captured through various lights, nat all natural lights, dim lights, bright lights, etcetera, etcetera, but single shot. Okay. What was he trying to do? Try to be as objective as possible. How real can you get? That is the idea. Okay. So, pushing the limits of reality and then telling us how monotonous reality could be. Okay, um, so, I refer again to Andre Bezon's ontology of the photographic image, his essay from What is Cinema, 1952. And according to Bezon, photography does not create eternity as art does. It embalms time, rescuing it simply from its proper corruption. So, in other words, Bezon is telling us that uh, photography has a historical purpose in capturing a view of the world forever. It embalms a moment, it freezes a moment. In the essay, he also compares photography with painting and according to him, photography and especially cinema is much more important as an art in capturing reality than painting for a variety of reasons and he it is a controversial idea because purists would always dispute that. Okay, painting captures reality many would argue, but this is what Bezon felt that photography and the cinema are discoveries that satisfy once and for all and in its very essence are obsession with realism as compared to painting. Because in painting, you know there is another hand that is at work. Cinema, although it is a collaborative art, when you watch a movie, you do not feel the intervention of uh, an outsider's hand. So, again continuing with Bezon, Bezon feels that the film is a powerful medium with technical process of production, which allows it to represent an object rather than replace it, which painting does according to him and ensures a sense of being true to life and the word for being true to life is very similitude. Okay. So, cinema according to Bezon is an art that comes closest to capturing realism or very similitude. Okay. Um, various cinematic movements which claim to be as realistic as possible. So, uh, most important is it and the earliest is Italian neo realism. Give me some examples. Bicycle thieves. Good. Bicycle thieves by Dasicha. 
we will be looking at these filmmakers, we will be uh, discussing these films as we uh, go on with the course. So, Italian neo realism, um, there is uh, the French pioneer as far as realism is uh, concerned, Jean Renoir. Jean Renoir happens to be the son of the painter Renoir. Okay, therefore, there is that painting, the painterly quality in his cinema. Okay, watch it. And uh, do you know that? Uh, uh, do you know anything about the famous disciple of Jean Renoir? Not the painter, but the son. there was a disciple, there was someone who learnt realism from Renoir, very famous person who you should know about, Satyajit Ray. When Renoir was in India shooting a movie called The River, okay, Satyajit Ray was one of his associates in India and it was because of Renoir's influence largely that Ray got interested in poetic realism. Therefore, in spite of all the allegations about uh, Ray showing gross poverty, actually it is a poetic poverty, poetic realism. Okay. So, there is a difference between uh, realism also, you know there are various kinds of realisms okay, that we will look at, but this was poetic realism, realistic, but poetically shown, aesthetically captured. Uh, we also had the politically motivated films of cinema verite, the name itself suggests verite, true, real, yeah, cinema verite, associated with documentaries in France. And then of course, there was a spate of the so called new wave cinema. So, we have the Hollywood new wave, we have the French new wave as associated with the works of Godard and Truffaut, largely Chabrol and Reznor, but we will be looking at those uh, makers as well. New wave British cinema, extremely important and then new wave in India, the so called parallel cinema in India, especially in Hindi cinema. There was uh, a particular period when cinema there, there existed a kind of parallel cinema. Of course, we today also we have a version of parallel cinema, but they are more mainstream. Okay. Today, we have a big star like Ranbir Kapoor willing to act in a so called realistic film, right. But the, the, uh, there was a time when uh, parallel cinema had its own exclusive niche with uh, its own exclusive directors and actors. There was no crossover there, today there is a crossover, that is the difference. Um, Dogme 95 is a movement which was established in Denmark in 1995 by Lars von Trier. and Thomas Winterberg and they set out or they placed a manifesto and they call their manifesto, refer to it as a vow of chastity that they should be, you know it is like, it is like a religious text, we will stick to it, to the dogma. So, the idea was to focus on the form of cinema and not necessarily the content. And it had all the features of the so called realistic cinema, which you would find in Italian neo realism and French new wave. Okay, we will be discussing that soon, but largely they dealt with bleak aspects of life. So, you would not find your entertainment there, <laughs> if you are looking entertainment as the way we understand. Some of the dogma principles were shooting on location and using no artificial props, showing the city or the location as it is. Please. There is one movie of his, which 
was shot entirely on a set the entire uh, the town was represented with uh, square boxes it was a movie with nicole kidman dog dog will dog will yeah dog will dog yeah and what's the theme of the movie drama i think hmm so perhaps there he has taken a break from adhering to dogma principles okay, of course when you take a big, big star then it comes with compulsions hmm uh, sound must not be produced using real sound and not uh, the dubbed version yes camera must be handheld and if you remember this particular clipping from dog day afternoon you do feel that it's the camera is never static is panning around it's it's moving it's as restless and edgy as the characters color as it is natural with no special light to beautify it no optical work uh, and uh, filters what do these so called filters do <coughs> camera filters if you are interested in photography no one is using a filter to capture me here let me assure you they give your skin a very yeah, consistent think. look yeah. that's one also filters are normally used to beautify and prettify actors make them look 20 years younger than what they are okay particularly if the actors are 45 years or you know even 50 years old people who are playing teenagers on screen okay so you use a special filter which which would make them I and mean, you can think of any number of films that's the idea to make a, a, a movie uh, the so called you know give a glossy look to the film okay but then that's artificiality it, therefore that's what dogma didn't want to yeah no melodrama i want you to understand what is melodrama explain to me what's melodrama i, I can i have a, a feeling that you what you are going to tell me but i want to hear it from you rehan what's melodrama i don't know What's melodrama? What's cheesy? What's cheesy? Okay. Something that is trying to lead you to some catharsis. Okay. Whatever. In over the top yeah, way. Exactly. Okay. <laughs> over the top kind of emotions. Give me an example, so that uh, people who are watching us understand it. P.S. I love you. P.S. I love you. Melodramatic. Okay. Om Shanti Om. Devdas, okay, but you know, Om Shanti Om is a very cleverly done film. Okay, it also subverts and spoofs its own melodrama. Yeah, so it's a different kind of a melodrama, and it's very self-conscious about its melodramatic aspirations. Yeah. Melodrama uh, has to be over the top. Like, I don't think that type of movie. not necessarily they is quite uh, they are quite realistic but melodrama is you uh, you know are essentially those movies which try to squeeze out emotions from you so um, certain representations or uh, uh, you know um, remakes i would call of devdas could be termed as melodramatic but not every every uh, visit to devdas is necessarily although the plot itself is uh, uh, um, quite you know sentimental so you sometimes it cannot be helped i would watch, i would request you to watch a movie perhaps i may not be able to screen it because there are so uh, i have a list of films that i want you to watch it's called 21 grams 21 grams sean penn benicio del toro naomi watts film make uh, critics have often interpreted 21 grams as a very good example of melodrama okay perhaps one of these days uh, we, it's a good way to understand what's a melodrama and if you agree that it's a melodrama but then it all depends on how it's done okay so whether it's an over the top melodrama or it's a subdued melodrama because the, if you look at the plot of 21 grams it's an out and out melodrama a woman's husband gets killed and his heart is transplanted in a dying man's heart and 
then the dying that this dying man played by Sean Penn, he comes alive <laughs> and falls in love with uh, the widow of the dead man and she also responds. Yeah. So, if that is not what, yeah. So, lots of the is the narrative that saves the movie, right. So, it is a plot is melodramatic. Uh, what are genres? Now, genre is not as easy to explain. Usually, we say western is a genre, we also say gangster is a genre, yeah, category, but then um, genre itself is a heavily contested term and scholars like Rick Altman have done phenomenal work on understanding what is a genre. Okay. But uh, uh, coming back to our dogma principle, Genres are unex, unacceptable. Okay. So, they do not want to make a kind of movie which can be categorized. So, no more, no making or no filming of genre kind of films. They also gave some technical uh, dictates like format should be 35 mm, not the cinemascopic format. And this is interesting. They did. They wanted to make it very clear that cinema is a collaborative art. So there is no such thing as an author. Remember, those who joined this course late, it's for them. What is an author? Please look it up. I think we referred to it in one of our initial classes. So director should not be credited. Directed by so and so. That means director is the captain of the ship, but not for the, for those who believed in the dogma principles. Okay, film is a collaborative art, that is what they believed. <coughs> yes. Surreal imagery mm -hmm. and obviously, uh, those may not be shot in the, uh, any real location, no. there should be. No. Again, he himself is contradicting mm -hmm. himself, no, not necessarily, see, when they say a movie should be shot according to dogma principles, okay. then the manifesto is sacred, but sometimes if they occasionally if they want to break out then why not. Okay. So, perhaps one of the films that you have just mentioned dog will or antichrist, okay, definitely not subscribing to the dogma principles, but perhaps that is what he wanted to do at a particular moment. So, that is what. Now, cinema verite literally it means truthful cinema. More or less the same principles, usually shot with light handheld cameras, actual locations and this is important now, shooting with real people, making films with real people the way the Sicha did in the bicycle thieves. Okay. Those were uh, non-professional actors, they were not actors who were in the profession of acting, he just picked them from somewhere and ask them to act, very op often it happens, non-professional actors. Within uh, constraints of budget, an interesting thing is that uh, they eschewed the idea of having a bound script. One of these days, we will have a real screenwriter talking to you about how important it is to have a, a bound screen play. Okay, we, we had someone like Jaydeep Sahani two years back with us who wrote the screenplay for Chagda India and several successful films, Company, etcetera. And where he felt that it is very important to have the sanctity of a bound script. But Cinema Verite felt that films can be shot without a script, okay, shoot it the way it comes to you and later we will edit it and make a movie out of it. Uh, we have already seen social realism uh, and Soviet, Soviet socialist realism. We also talked about Lev Kuleshev, the man with a movie camera capturing this. This is what he did before these uh, concepts became fashionable. So, whatever people like Lev Kuleshev and Einstein, Einstein did those days, uh, dogma and so called cinema, where it, they, they just uh, 
you know um, expanded on that, okay, but the ideas were very much present. Again uh, to respond to your concept of surrealism, which was a short lived artistic movement, but then again one Freer brings it back in Antichrist. The idea was to explore subjective and not objective, we were talking about distinction between objectivity and subjectivity. So, here to capture real the dream like states, capture subjectivity during dream states and was concerned with subverting the logic of representation. Surrealism on the uh, uh, at one level plays with the narrative form. I will give you some example. Now, uh, this is a still from Ashia and Delo by Louis Brunel, a Spanish master. where you see close up of a woman's eye and a man's hand holding a razor blade and trying to what? Trying to do what? Yes, cut her across her eyeball. Yes, so this is the high, you know, greatest kind of realism one can attain and did they actually do it? So, whose eyes was that? A calf eye. A calf's eye. Okay, but they actually had a calf and that was that hand belonged to the director himself. Okay, how real can you get? Now, Italian neo realism, they focused on the films of working class people. Again, think dog day afternoon. You are talking about poverty, we were talking about uh, um, the chasm between the rich and the poor and Italian realism became a vehicle for filmmakers who were interested in description of Italian history and society. Again it explores the same idea as Soviet socialist cinema and also some of our own new wave parallel cinema of the 70s were concerned with the same idea, same principles that so in a just society the means of production would be more justly distributed, evenly distributed. Um, Italian neorealistic cinema also was based on true incidents, just the way you have just seen Sidney Lumet's Dog Day Afternoon based on. So, they, uh, as far as possible, they try to base their plots on real and true incidents. Occasionally, they also used newsreel footage. As in Cinema Verite and as in Dogme Principles Manifesto, they aspire to shoot films on as much as possible on actual locations and tried using non-professional actors, actors who are not really trained to be, you know people who are not trained to be actors. Um, how many of you are familiar with uh, a theorist called Frederick Jameson? Are you? Not really, Frederick Jameson, The Political Unconscious is a book and also there is a, a, another book called the signatures of the visible. And uh, Frederick Jameson who is supposedly the most influential uh, literary critic of our times, he has written extensively on uh, several aspects of our lives and cinema and society, where he discusses threadbare dog day afternoon. So, Italian neorealism, the plot and characters were often used as a vehicle for ideas. Those of you who are uh, familiar with the works of Bertolt Brecht, the German uh, dramatist, 
he uses a term called agit prop, agitation and propaganda. Agit prop, agitation and propaganda. All art should lead to agitation and propaganda. That should, that means, in other words, art should be a vehicle of ideas, not just for entertainment. So, legacy of neo realism is extremely impressive, and if you look at films of Satyajit Ray, especially Ray's early cinema, you just mentioned Ghatak. Okay, if you mention, if you watch his cinema, then you will understand that how these people continued the legacy of the neo realists. Roberto Rossellini, another practitioner of Italian neo realism, and one of his uh, most uh, well known movie is Open City Rome, 1945 again dealing with a particular historical event and having non-professional actors in the lead roles shot on actual locations and in natural light with natural sound. The seachars with uh, the bicycle thieves and many a time we are asked what is surrealism and how far is it different from realism. So, I told you surrealism is con concerned basically with interpreting a state of mind, dream like state. Magic realism on the other hand is associated with the fantastic in films and literature of course. So, many of these Latin American writers, Isabella Allen hmm, for example, um, Laura Esquivel like water for chocolate they resort to using magic realism. Even a film like Chocola, based on a novel, yeah, it, uh, it plays on that element. Real, uh, yeah. they, these are realistic works, okay, films as well as uh, 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 the literature they are based on. But, why, why, why use the element of magic realism at all? What does this uh, tone or the tinge of magic do to these films? Okay. Whenever they want to uh, portray a character uh, which is non-conformist, it is always safer to use magic realism. Okay, because many time, many a time when you present them in a stark realism, they may become monotonous. Okay. So, that is the idea, Marquez does it all the time, Salman Rushdie does it all the time, okay. magic realism. Now, it has become, uh, now magic realism has become a common place device, uh, practically every second writer uses this device, but that was not the intention and purpose, it was used for a reason, it has become like as common as jump cut now. Pan, uh, pan's Labyrinth, you call it pan's oh, Pan's Labyrinth is another interesting movie, we should be doing it. Um, well, it combines elements of realism and magic realism, it is not, no, because when certain filmmakers and writers, they want to convey certain political truths, they resort to magic realism, that is the idea. When they want to add a layer to the character as, as she said, they resort to magic realism, otherwise it will be end up becoming a documentary. So, that saves it from becoming a documentary, but it still it tries to convey certain truths. Not exactly magic realism, but we are, it, it has a category of its own. See, we are going to now look at a, uh, there is no category, genre, there is no genre, but uh, um, Broadly speaking, eternal sunshine is cinema of the mind. Okay. Mind has several <coughs> layers to it. Yesterday, we were discussing old boy, hypnosis, hmm? erasure of memory. 
So, all these things are also done in eternal sunshine. So, cinema of the mind, memento. So, Pan's labyrinth of course, uh, by Del Toro is definitely an example of magic realism. And these are comic films Liar Liar, Bruce Almighty with Jim Carrey. They employ magic realism in order to convey certain comic element, okay. they have no other higher purpose. Entertaining films, watch them, uh, but uh, definitely, but, and they are not, we, we, we could not call them realistic also, but they do employ the device of magic realism. Yeah, this is what I was looking, uh, was, uh, this is what I was talking about as contrasted with poetic realism you have the category of dirty realism. So, the word itself says it all. Okay, poetic realism, you understand what is poetic realism and dirty realism, you understand, I mean think slum dog millionaire as an exemplar of dirty realism. Think train spotting, that is one of the greatest movies ever made. Bleak stories of everyday life and told ble bleakly, okay. there is no romanticization there. We know glossing over there. Okay. And very at closely at, uh, associated is the idea of gritty realism, life and its struggles in realistic manner. Again, look, think 127 hours. Ken Loach is considered one of the greatest exponents of gritty realism. Ken Loach. Absolutely. The movie, uh, what was that movie that beat Lagan at the Oscars? No country for old. No, oh no, that was no, no man's land. No man's land is a very good example of gritty realism. Watch it, okay, it is not as bleak, but yeah, of course, it deals with the, with not so glamorous aspects of life. After all, it is about war, but watch it, yeah, a wonderful movie. Whereas, uh, the realism in Lagan, the so called realism in Lagan, uh, and you contrast it with the uh, no man's land and you will understand. Yes? Gangs of Basipur, of course, yeah. But then, uh, you, you, you know, again we are talking about the parallel cinema movement in India, which is happening, which has become mainstream. Dipakar Banerjee's movies, basically, are, I mean, think Shanghai. Okay. Shore in the city, yeah. All these uh, city symphonies, okay, they are basically uh, adhering to these principles. But then, of course, they are glamorized versions. I mean, once upon a time in Mumbai, okay, uh, I do not have to elaborate on that, okay. But Shore in the city, yes, it, uh, it claims to be extremely realistic, it tries to be. We had the director who spoke at one of our recent conferences, Krishna DK in the city. So, um, we will continue tomorrow. Thank you very much.